New Zealand Bloggers Network Meetup. I'm Scott Nesbitt. I'm Jan Mayer. We're the co-organizers of this event. Yep. And uh, this time around, we have a guest speaker coming all the way from uh, Brantford, Ontario, Canada. Rob Levine, your social business mentor. I've known Rob for a number of years, and in that time, he has to be the most knowledgeable person I've met in the areas of social media, social media marketing, and social business. I hand it over to Rob. He can take over, give a little more of an intro, and um, go from there. Robert? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert Levine, and uh, I am broadcasting to you from Brantford, Ontario. Now, for those of you that don't know Brantford, uh, that is the birthplace of the great one, Wayne Gretzky, but more importantly, this is where Alexander Graham Bell actually came uh, to rest and relax and invent the telephone, and this is actually where the first long-distance phone call was done, was from Brantford, Ontario to Paris, Ontario, which is about 20 kilometers away from here, and we now live in a world where I am awake at 2.49 a.m., on a Thursday morning and calling for free over live internet to Auckland, New Zealand. So uh, Alexander Graham Bell would be very proud of technology as we have it right now, so let's not abuse that. Um, I guess, Scott, you have a slew of questions for me, or do you want me to just kind of rhyme and rough, or what do you want? Uh, maybe we'll do a little of both, Rob. Um, okay. First off, maybe you could uh, tell us a little more about yourself. Aside from my lame intro. Uh, <laughs> well, unlike the lame intro, I'm not a lame individual. Now, how's that? Uh, I, go by the, I go by multiple brands. Uh, I do strategic coaching under the branding Social Business Mentor. I do uh, tactical coaching under the brand Content Creators for Hire. And I'm also the producer of what we call Poptics, which is a little bit of a internet television type of thing that we're trying to do uh, right here out of Brantford, leveraging technology such as YouTube, Google Hangout, and all those other stuff. Uh, best known uh, for a couple of quotes that uh, that are relevant to what we talk about today. One of them is repurpose, repurpose, repurpose. That's one thing you're going to hear quite a bit. Uh, the other one is content is free. Context is where the value is. And at the end of the day, when you're whether or not you're blogging, presenting, or whatnot, if you're just providing content, that content's Googleable. It's available on the internet in one form or another. Uh, but your context is your own. And at the end of the day, context is where the value is. So by balancing what you repurpose and adding your context to it for the audience on that one really at the end of the day is your value proposition but on that note I will pass it back to Scott and uh, we'll get into the questions okay so obviously we're a group of bloggers here uh, some are professional some are wannabe professional some are just starting out some just do it for themselves but no matter what how can we take best advantage of social media to promote our work and to build and maintain an audience okay the um well, first of all, social media in 2014 and social media in 2008 are, are completely different animals. So the, the reality for those of you that are just getting into it right now and you start using uh, the Internet to find out all those wonderful articles that tell you how to do things, keep in mind that most of that information is five years old. Okay, the Twitter of 2008 is not the Twitter of 2014. Uh, Google Plus didn't exist at all. Uh, Facebook was pre-IPO. Uh, you didn't have to pay to have promoted posts. You would have uh, a reach uh, of 80% as opposed to 2% on your Facebook pages. So things are drastically different. The one thing that has not changed, however, are subscriber lists. And that's a good place to, to own your own contacts, own your own connections, and so forth. So never disregard the list. Having said that, open rates and bounce rates and all that are, are declining as well as people just delete uh, emails as opposed to actually reading them. The key, however, is, as cliche as it might be, is knowing where your community is and making sure that your community is aware that you've done something new or you put something else out there. The other reality as well is, you know, using Twitter as an example, the odds are, like, here's a little experiment. Everybody in the room, close your eyes for literally three seconds. Everybody close your eyes, count to three, and open them. Okay? You just missed about a thousand tweets. Did you see my content? Okay. So, 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 so the reality is this: is something like Twitter is a great means to get something out there. But when was the last time you actually looked at someone's Twitter wall, 
or Facebook wall. You typically are spending most of your time on the news feed. And unless it's a algorithm such as what Facebook is doing that shows you the most important posts or the most active posts, the reality is you will likely have missed what a person has put out there. So there's nothing stopping you from putting out that same content over and over and over again. Because the odds are someone hasn't seen it. Whereas the old rules would have been, don't post it more than once. Because back in the day, you posted it once, someone saw it, and you know, you'd be pissing them off if you posted it again. So I make a point uh, of having a little bit of automation. Uh, and a lot of that is making sure that some of the most recent stuff that I'm doing uh, gets uh, tweeted on a more regular basis. And I actually go back into my news feed and I delete the stuff that didn't get any engagement so that if someone were to look through my feed, they don't see the same posts over and over again. You can use that same uh, strategy for Facebook. You can use that same strategy for Google+. At the end of the day, the reality is this. Unless you are directly interacting with your community either via a group and that's either a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group or you know anything like that a meetup the odds are that they are in a news feed and your challenge is to make sure that when they are online they are seeing your content and the reality is that we live in a, a worldwide world you know my local audience is completely asleep right now uh, but, uh, you know, halfway around the world, people are reading tweets and whatnot. So when people say the best time to, to post something is at 6 p.m. or at 8 p.m., is that your time zone? Is that the time zone of your audience? Can you mo make multiple posts for that 6 to 8 p.m. time frame, depending on different time zones? So even using something like Facebook, you have the ability to set... Uh, the privacy settings for your posts. There's nothing stopping you from having a privacy setting based on a localization as well. So you're not spamming the same content to everybody. You're just sharing that content in multiple time zones at different times. So those are the things that I'd like to put out there. The tools are still extremely you know, powerful. They're free in many ways. Having said that, like I said, promoted posts, ads and whatnot. But the real reality is everything that you're reading online for the most part is five years old and you know it may sound like a multi-level marketing to some because you typically have the people that were successful five years ago saying what worked for them and honestly if those same people were to go online right now and follow all their rules they probably would not get to where they were and a lot of that is because things have changed so looking at networks that are coming off you know, coming up uh, that haven't really been flooded by marketers is a great way of doing it as well. You don't necessarily have to be on the biggest networks like Facebook and whatnot. You can be on small little community networks. A lot of people forget Pinterest before the marketers took it over was just a nice little dedicated mom blogger site. So try to find those little niche communities and spend your time there as well because you probably have a better chance of reaching out and connecting with 300 people on a small niche than 1.3 billion people on a really big network. How's that, Scott? Sounds good. Uh, do you have any niche networks that you could recommend? Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, you know, uh, let's say a year ago when uh, when Vine first came out. Vine was great as a niche community when it first came out, and then all of a sudden the marketers got wind of it. So it's happening faster and faster that what was niche is not becoming niche. Um, for blogging, medium for a while was very niche. You would get a lot more hits. So a lot of it at the end of the day is talk to people, ask them where they're posting. I'll be honest, if you're blogging right now, you know, LinkedIn posts, uh, you know, the, the ability to do a blogging within LinkedIn is still not completely tapped in. And the nice thing with that is you can tap uh, your uh, your subscribers, the people that actually are connected to you on uh, on uh, t on uh, LinkedIn uh, so that they're uh, made aware that your post. So your LinkedIn platform, to be perfectly honest, would be a great place to repurpose some of your content to a target audience if you've got the feature enabled. And it's a slow rollout, but uh, you'll know if you have it if you got that little pencil mark on your status update. So I would say, honestly, LinkedIn is, even though the network is not niche, the ability to blog on that network still is very niche. And the nice thing, too, is you can share it within groups in there as well. Okay. Now, um, obviously, you should go into social media with a plan. What would you consider the elements of a solid social media plan for a blogger to be? 
Well, regardless of whether or not it's a blogger or, or, or anybody else, at the end of the day, you need to know what you're trying to achieve, right? If all you're doing is writing or, or creating content for the purposes of just, you know, exercising your brain, mission accomplished, you know? If at the end of the day, your, your goal is to convert people into uh, believing you're a thought leader and you, your content does that, mission, you know, mission accomplished. If your goal at the end of the day is monetization through uh, ad revenue and stuff like that through co-branded pages, uh, you know, and you do that, congratulations. If at the end of the day you're someone like me and your main point is to use the blogging platforms to create social novels and part of the process would be a conversion page for services, that's one way of doing it as well. So at the end of the day, your strategy is your own because you are you know, the one defining what you want out of it. So step one, what do you want to have out of it? A lot of people that have been, let's say, working in a corporate mindset for, for years, decades, or whatnot, have never really had the opportunity to do creative writing or expressive writing, and that may be all they need to do, and, and who cares how many people have read the, view, the, the posts or where it ranks in the SEO or whatnot, the sheer fact of writing was enough for them. So the strategy at the end of the day starts with what you want to have out of it, model your goals accordingly and you know I tend to use the word iterate to success I'm very much a an agile pragmatic type of individual and if you know what you're iterating towards I always have a tendency of saying is when you're doing anything that's entrepreneurial there's really no plan B there's a plan C D E all the way to Z but there's no B because you've already decided on that direction and part of that is the strategy of you know truly aligning your end goal with who you are as a blogger does that kind of make sense yeah so how often should uh, people revisit that plan if, if at all or tweak it you know what? Uh, going back to the agile mindset, you gotta you gotta pivot, pivot, pivot. Uh, I use the word, like I said, iterate to success. Some people that might be every post. Some of them might be every social novel. Every time you start a, a fresh blog site, you know, I I'm jeez, I'm trying to think. I probably got like ten to fifteen different. Uh, blogs that are out there, probably more than that. Uh, when do you continue uh, contributing to them? When do you stop? Uh, when when do you type the word the end at the end of your book? You know, So I think all of those touch points are areas where you do an assessment. And if you've said everything that you needed to say in that particular uh, format or blog uh, series or whatnot, and you're done, you know, you, you move on and you take what you learn from that and you implement it into the next blog series. And that could be a, a series of articles or an outright new blog. So it's hard to say, but I would say every time you post something, you, you, you look at your analytics, you look at your writing. If, if your goal is to become a better writer at the end of the day, you compare your first blog post to your last blog post and you ask yourself, what did I do well? And, you know, for those of you that know anything about agile you know the basic model is this you know if something works do more of it if something doesn't work do less of it and i think that's applicable to anything as well as blogging okay now i want to move on to the side of your new brand social business mentor mm -hmm. <laughs> for those um who use their blogs to promote their businesses how can they make those businesses more social <laughs> Well, social business, first of all, comes from the charity world. It, it kind of got hijacked by the entire uh, social CRM enterprise 2.0 crowd. And, you know, it's so easy to put a prefix of social or a suffix of 2.0 and call yourself modern. Uh, so a couple of key things there. One, one of, first and foremost, when you look at what a charity organization does, the original term social business came from that. They're involved in their community. They tend to give more than they take. Uh, they, they're empathetic to, to their audience. Uh, and businesses that have a very similar model but yet have a for-profit concept can benefit from that because really at the end of the day, if you're not empathetic to what your client base needs, your messaging is not going to resonate with them. If you're not uh, building a community and engaging with the community, no one's going to be aware uh, of the stuff that you're doing. So it's not just about being transparent or, or being on a particular social media platform or whatnot. 
it's the mindset that comes with it. Uh, a lot of people are surprised when I tell them, you know, that that five years ago I was an extremely introverted individual, very shy, no networking and whatnot. Uh, and now, I, you know, I'm, I'm able to do live to air presentations and TV, you know, interviews and so forth with confidence. So really part of that model came from myself becoming a social business. Uh, and like I said, transparency is part of it. Honesty is, is a huge part of it. Because at the end of the day, we live in a world where the only markets that we have available to us anymore are the niche markets. And that's the sad fact, is unless you are a, a major monopoly uh, that, 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 that is cost-cutting and, and you know, are able to, to provide services at a price point that no one else would be able to compete with, you're really just having to target a niche. And by being a social business or, or just being straight-up human, you're in a position where you can find those few people that truly get your message. And, and I've always said this, you know, all it takes is one. Uh, a good friend of mine is saying that a successful business only really needs three good clients, right? So what a social business allows you to do is not only develop yourself, develop the people around you, re-question how things should be done in a modern day, but also has a better chance of you finding those real clients, the ones that truly get your service, that'll talk about uh, that service and that customer experience and all that to the, their friends. And that, at the end of the day, is the only way, in my mind, that you will be able to be successful in this modern day. Because the opposite, find the cheapest price point, deliver it, even if it's at a loss, and count your lucky stars if all of a sudden that job doesn't get shipped elsewhere, right? So we are living in a niche market. And the best way to target niching, no different than blogging, is to put more of yourself out there uh, so that the people that get it resonate and build far more lasting relationships that at the end of the day, going back to the content is free, context is where the value is, you can have the exact same, I'll use Seth Godin's example as an example, two paintings that look identical. One was created by someone that was making two cents an hour, and this one was created by someone that had a brand. They're the exact same painting. One is content, free, valueless. The other one has context added to it, and a person doesn't question how many zeros are at the end of that painting. They'll buy it, not for the painting, but the context around it. And that's because the artist, in this particular case, developed a social business model around his painting, call it branding, okay? And at the end of the day, they're able to work in an economic platform that far uh, you know, exceeds the the uh, income potential of the mass market, com uh, you know, commodity pricing. Uh, there's a fresh quote that, that I put out there recently, and, and let's see if I can say it properly because it is fresh. Uh, if your understanding of the free market economy is to focus on the word free, you're fundamentally missing the main point of economics. Yeah, I remember that, that one. That was okay. So, so uh, it's it, I, I may have messed it up or what? Not it, it is three o'clock in the morning. But the the truth is in that statement, right? You are either going to focus on the free, and model yourself accordingly, or you're going to find a way where through redefining your business and how you do business. Uh, and like I said, just look at how charity organizations are able. You know, we, we talk about crowdfunding right now and crowdsourcing and all those wonderful things. Fundraising was done successfully by charity organizations for years. How do you get someone to give you millions and millions and millions of dollars, you know, through fundraising? They are a social business. People become empathetic to it. How are you going to get your clients to give you more than a penny on the dollar? The same model applies. So the social business model is more than just talking about being a transparent 2.0 social organization. It's really leveraging all the tools that you have. Um, a good model that I like to tell people as well is if you were to go back 10 years ago, uh, if you were in the IT field and you had an RFP and the guy came to you and said, listen, I need to have a quote for an email system, calendaring system, document sharing, video conferencing system. I'd like to throw in some uh, geolocation into the mix for good measure and, you know, maybe some 
video conferencing worldwide at no cost. And let's throw in uh, the ability to do phone calls as well at no charge. What would that cost you? A billion dollars maybe? We now live in a world that Google gives you all of that for free. So now all of a sudden your platforms are saving you so much money that you're able to take that money that you would have spent building and implementing it into your model as well. And that's part of social business as well is not looking at things the way they were done prior where everything had to be built. We live in the platform era. I call it the disposable web, but that's fundamentally my point. So it's a combination of mindset and re-challenging what tools you want to use so that instead of spending all your money on the infrastructure and then figuring out whether or not you even have a strategy for what that infrastructure is going to be used for or a recovery model, all of this infrastructure cost disappears and you're now able to reallocate that money into, oh, I don't know, treating the customer properly. Okay. So um, you've, been talking about, you've been talking about a little about tools. What are some of the tools that you know, people could use in conjunction with their blogging to promote their posts, to promote their content, to promote their wares? Well, uh, maybe this is where the, the repurpose, repurpose, repurpose might come in nicely. Um, just because you created the content on your own media, so the, you know your hosted site, doesn't mean that you can't repurpose that content elsewhere. I'll give you a good example. You start off with this live to air, which is going to be archived on YouTube and downloadable as an MP4 as soon as we're done. By the way, I want a copy of this when you're done, Scott. So Dropbox me a uh, Dropbox me an MP4 when you're done. You take that MP4, yeah. You take that MP4 and you extract the audio. Well, now you've got a podcast. You take that audio, you send it to a transcription agent that is a penny a penny of minute. Now you've got every single blog post you'll need for the next month because an hour of text broken up into 10 posts, boom, you've repurposed that. So the platform and the content work together in the sense that you can take the exact same message and constantly repurpose it across all these platforms. So uh, I say three insightful things, all of a sudden you got an infographic, the, the three things you need to remember. Uh, a fancy quote, next thing you know you have a mem with a quote. So to me, it's not just a matter of saying which platform am I going to put content on, is more of the content that I've created, how can I repurpose that so that I can mass distribute that same message. So instead of taking the time to create 10 new messages, I'm repurposing that content across 10 different platforms. Now what you have is a consistent message across all the platforms, and you're able, no different than uh, you know the platform economy I was talking about earlier, you're able to dial in that message and only focus on a couple of key messages as opposed to saying, I need to write every day on, on different topics, on different platforms and so forth. So when you look at the platforms that are out there, um, I relaunched what used to be a podcast and I've converted into a video interview uh, series. So the actual video is hosted on YouTube, but I'm using my LinkedIn posts for that interview series. Okay, those interviews are only distributed there, but they're also hosted on YouTube. Same thing, you can take any platform, look at it, find the, the benefits of that platform, and make sure that your content is repurposed to really leverage that platform. Uh, let's say you want to do something on, inf on, um, on Pinterest as an example. Well, you're not going to take your blog post and put it on there, you're likely going to grab an image from your post uh, that will link back to the article. But really, are, is a person going to click on it just because it's got a nice little eye stock photo? No. You might want to take uh, you know a couple of, of quotes from your articles, create a graphic with you know the, the hundred odd characters of your quote, and post that on Instagram or Pinterest or, or even Facebook. That's becoming more and more visual, right? So. It's not the platforms. It's not the content. It's figuring out what you want to say and how you can repurpose that message on as many different mediums that make sense so that regardless of where people are, your branding is consistent across the board. Now, that is specific to a branding strategy. Going back to what I'm saying, if you just want to be someone that's creating content for the, for the fun of creating content, Go crazy, have as much diverse content as you want, right? Okay. Now, going back to your podcast, uh, one of my favorite ones was um, the one you talked about, social media etiquette. 
But it's really easy to be a jerk online, as we all know. So how can a blogger using social media to promote their work uh, avoid breaching the bounds of etiquette? <laughs> well, it, it, etiquette is, is funny because, uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's a moving stone, right? Uh, etiquette in New Zealand is completely different than etiquette in Brantford. And, you know, if, if I were to put up a couple of fingers, I'm sure uh, different people around the world would see those fingers differently. So you really need to, to, to know your audience and where they are so that your etiquette is on par. par. Uh, you know, what is considered interruption marketing in one country may not be interruption marketing in somewhere else. So to me, and this kind of goes back to, to the social business question, you know, the being, you know, don't be a jerk, basically, is as long as it is a true representation of who you are, um, it's okay to break certain ethics or boundaries or whatnot if it's consistent with your behavior. Because there's nothing worse, in my mind, than a person that comes across one way online but has a completely different other ethic in real life. I'd rather have that, that honest ethics come through in their messaging. So it's a strange world because there's sometimes where being the jerk or being the, 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 the off character or whatnot will work for your brand. Uh, I know a, a, a few well-known speakers that, that, that get away with a lot just because people take them as being that guy. So there's no ethics for them. And when I mean bad ethics, they got business ethics. So they're just not following the ethics of the platforms. But at the end of the day, it, it'd be too easy to say, would you post that if your mom saw it? Because my mom's on Facebook. She sees what I post. And Lord knows she's probably shaking her head at half the stuff. At the end of the day, really, you got to be yourself. If people are responding negatively to who, you, who you're presenting or how you're presenting yourself, one of two things has happened. One, you truly are being a jerk and you really should look at yourself as an individual, not just as how you're acting on those networks. But they may also not be your community, right? So ethics is interesting. Because it's too easy to just say be nice. Because sometimes you you ha you, can't, you have to be the bad guy. Does that kind of make sense? I know I, I I added a couple of layers to your question there, but I think you got the general gist of it. Yeah, I got the general idea. Now I just want to open the floor to questions here. Um, anybody, if you have any questions for Rob? The man in the back with the arms. I know he's got a question. With regard to reusing your content. Um, wouldn't that uh, result in Google penalizing you because of people that you get the content? Let, let, let me clarify that. There, there's reusing and repurposing. There are two different things, right? So just uh, blanketly copying and pasting the same blog entry on every single platform, yes. From an SEO point of view, you would be penalized because Google doesn't like duplicate content, right? But this goes back to the content versus context. While the content might be the same, you should be implementing a different context, and that context is to the platform in question, meaning um, the same content that's on a video to a podcast to a blog is viewed differently from, a, from a Google because they are three different pieces of the same content in t three different digital formats. So Google doesn't see them at the same way. So I've repurposed across three different platforms, but I haven't copied it you know, we're verba verbatim, right? Same thing, if you are repurposing your content into something like a Pinterest, a, a quote on, on an image, you know, those mem styles or an infographic, you've repurposed the content, but you've actually created new content, not copied existing content. Does that kind of make sense? Right, so it's the, uh, the fact that you're doing, using different platforms each time you're repurposing the content, to a certain degree, and, and keep in mind, you can also, uh, to a certain degree, you can take snippets, and I'm talking paragraphs or whatnot, uh, and let's say, let's say you had a really good article on your own blog site, okay, and you wanted to generate traffic to that. Well, you could go to another blogging platform, take a couple of quotes, and write a, uh, a wrapper article around those quotes, right? So the idea there is each one of them is drawing people from a little bit of con uh, content into the larger content, right? It'd be no different than uh, if you 
were being interviewed by someone else. They would quote your article. They would cite your article, right? There's nothing stopping you from writing something on another platform in this in text that is citing your blog entry. You're not copying it verbatim. You're basically pointing out a couple of key things and maybe adding an extra paragraph that adds context to that audience. So if your host content, which is the main one you want the SEO to be on, is here, and you're saying, okay, in this article there's something where I talk uh, uh, about something that is beneficial to mom bloggers or um, uh, you know sh people shopping or whatnot. Well, you would take that piece, put it in an article, wrap it around an idea of these are the things you may want to consider if shopping and you're female, and by the way, you now link back to your main article. So that's actually helping your SEO because you now have a secondary site with a higher Alex uh, ranking, r ranking more than likely than your own blog site, giving a proper link back, but it's it's through taking a snippet and adding to it. And it'd be no different if someone that were to uh, uh, do a research paper and cite a whole bunch of different things, right? So if you think of your multi-platform blogging strategy similar to that, where your primary article is your main reference point and you're just creating other articles that refer to it and expand upon it for the audience in question, you're actually doing good in my point. And honestly, let's be completely clear. When it comes to Google and SEO, most people discover now, they don't search. If you, you know, what is number one on Google? First of all, the first three are promoted posts and you're logged into Google, so it's actually a social search Meaning, you know, the two people that I see on the screen right now, if you were to go on Google, log in yourself, and search on the exact same thing, you would get a completely different front page, right? So, honestly, I'm not as concerned about what, S, uh, what Google and SEO thinks. I'm more concerned about the audience in that market or in that niche or on that platform that I'm providing valuable content to. It. Because at the end of the day, if they got something out of that content, even if it was duplicated, you've achieved your end goal. Your end goal really should not be to strive to be number one on Google. Your end goal should be to be, strive to be number one in the hearts and mind of the people that you're trying to target. And if that's the case, they're not going to search to find your content. They're already going to know where you are. And if you've achieved that, You've bypassed the number one uh, paid firewall or content wall out there, which is the Google search engine. Do you follow what I'm getting at? Yes, no? Yeah, I think it's yes. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, turn, turn, turn it so, yeah, there you go. I can hear it better when it's facing the person. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, as a as a new blogger, um, yeah. How do you create um, credibility for your audience? Like, how do you get people to trust you? <laughs> I have I have a product and I'm trying to sell it, but I don't know how. Well, to let, let me let, let let me replace the question uh, the question a bit. Regardless of whether or not you're blogging, or you're in a room with the people you're in right now, how do they trust you? The, per the person that's right behind you that I was talking, do you trust her? Is she trustworthy? Do you know her? Can you vouch for her? I only get it tonight. <laughs> there you go. I, tr I, I trust you. Right? <laughs> yeah. So to, to me, it's the same thing, right? It, it's not... You can tr be trusted over time through consistent content. You know, that would be the traditional answer, right? But you could become the most trusted person in the world with just one article. Okay, so it's not it's not a, 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 an easy answer because everybody is different. Everybody has a different perception of trust. Everybody has a natural extension. Um, you know, I consider myself trustworthy, but you know, you guys have met me for the first time. So how do I come across being trustful to you? Well, uh, I come with certain uh, credentials given to myself. Well, no, that doesn't make me trustworthy. Uh, I smile. Well, that 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 makes me trustworthy, right? Uh, I, I'm in Brantford. I tend to hug people. That makes me trustful. Okay, so you see what I'm kind of getting at? It's not what you write. 
Okay, you can write the you can write the best blog posts on the t the seven point five things that you need to do to be trustworthy on the internet, and still be a complete douche. <laughs> no offense, right? So so at the end of the day, it's no different than whether or not you're uh, you're meeting your spouse's family for the first time, and you know the mother-in-law is staring at you and going, "I don't trust you. You're not you're not you know you're not my daughter. Or you're, you're not good for my son or whatever." Those same things apply regardless of whether or not it's blogging, marketing, sales, HR, operation, and it kind of goes back to that etiquette point of view. And going back to my point about a social business. Are, if you were to be a charitable organization and you know you're asking for money people want to know why so you build a story around you know uh, these children are in dying need of these books and whatnot and and people believe the story and they trust the story before they necessarily trust the person pitching the story and it could be the same way and a story in this particular case could be something as simple as a bio or what people tell you testimonials go a long way it's it's you know there's a word that someone uh, introduced me to a few years ago and and I like it and I don't like it because it comes with a, a certain connotation it's one thing for you to say something it's co something completely different when someone else edifies you instead you know so if I were to just uh, log in to, to hang out and start talking to you without Scott giving a preamble my trust factor would be much lower because I was not edified in the process. And that, at the end of the day, is recommendations, testimonials, word of mouth, you know, all of that type of stuff. So if you're a trustworthy person in real life, you'll become a trustworthy blogger. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, just in general. Um... <laughs> Uh, we just have a question. Oh my um, God! There's someone else there. I didn't even see you there. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I uh, uh, I would just have a question, in general. You know, because there's this blogger.com page, for instance, from Google. Would you yep. uh, rather recommend a page like that, or would you say uh, you stick to a own WordPress page? Okay. So so let let me let me make a couple of notes there. Uh, first and foremost, if you were to go to socialbusinessmentor.com, that is actually a blogger site. So the very fact that my brand is on a blogger site should tell you something right there. Okay, It, it is deeply integrated with Google Plus now with the commenting from the SEO, the authorship, and so forth. It's far more than the blogger that it was pre-Google Plus. Right? So from a easy way of integrating your content into the SEO behemoth that's Google, Blogger is quite good. The downside with Blogger is that it is hosted by Google, it's not self-hosted. The positive side of that is it's got a high ranking because it's part of the Google infrastructure, so you know that Google will be you know, searching its own uh, areas before it searches out, outside their own areas. Uh, I have sites on Tumblr, WordPress, Medium, Ghost, uh, Blogger, LinkedIn, even Facebook notes are considered blogging when you really think about it. Is one better than the other? No. If you are looking for an easy way to just map uh, a domain name that you own to a hosted platform, Tumblr, Blogger work really well because it's basically just a DNS entry. So on my uh, domain, I have, you know, socialbusinessmentor.com. I go to blogger.com. I associate the two. Now all of a sudden, you know, whenever I hit socialbusinessmentor.blogspot.ca, it's no different than socialbusinessmentor.com. Same thing with my studio, uh, tdgv.net. That's entirely Tumblr. So there are great ways of taking a domain and associating it to a hosted platform to make it look like it is a true domain. When you get into WordPress, uh, that's where you have to start paying if you want the uh, the hosted WordPress to be associated with a domain, or all of a sudden you're self-hosting and you're having to pay for all that infrastructure yourself. So all of them are great in that they are containers for content, right? So 
They all have the ability to have embedded con uh, embedded tags. They all have the ability to do a rich media. They have great formatting. You can do it in, in straight HTML or in text or all of that. They're all integrated into the ability to do social shares and commenting. So they're all there. They all have the same functionality. At the end of the day, though, WordPress to me is still the gorilla in the room in that if you were to create any website these days, I would start with a WordPress. Even if I was just creating a landing page, I created in WordPress. Uh, I try to do self-hosting as much as possible. Uh, I've got about four WordPress, five WordPress instances that are um, hosted on WordPress.com. Do, does one get more traction than the other? The, the, the host itself really doesn't play a factor there. It really comes down to how you market the content, how you drive the traffic and all that, right? So the gotchas, however, is you can do a lot of optimization if you're self-hosting on your WordPress, whereas if you are redirecting to a Tumblr or to a Blogger or to a WordPress.com, um, your potentially penalized by the performance of their own systems. Similarly, if you don't have enough money to have a decent hosting provider at your end, your same content could be loading 10 times slower on your self-hosted as well, and all of that stuff comes into play. The nice thing with uh, something like Blogger, uh, to use my point, is it's being maintained for you. You know, new, when Google Plus first came in, uh, the the fact that they t took care of all the integration strategy for it, you don't have to think about stuff like that. You're just focusing on creating great content, right? And hopefully adding a valuable context to it. If you're doing self-hosted WordPress, every time there's an upgrade, every time there's a plugin upgrade, every time that there's a theme update, you're constantly having to, to make sure that one update's not breaking the other. But the flip side to that is if you're on a hosted platform and they ch decide to change the entire look and feel, you've got no say, right? So I'm giving you a lot to consider there, but that's the reality is they're all in play. Um, and they have different audiences. Like I said, uh, you, if you create your website using Tumblr as an example, you'll have a website that looks as good as any website out there. You know, It's obvious that it's a theme-based website. But the audience on Tumblr, they're more like an Instagram, Pinterest type of thing. They're an images type of thing. So your blog posts that you're putting on there won't get any traction on the Tumblr network. Whereas if you're posting on the WordPress.com, you got a lot of people that are logged into WordPress.com who just go random blog reading, right? But that's, that's the reality of that world. The problem, however, is uh, for every blog that 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 stops getting written on there's 10 new blogs that come up because you know it's it's the latest greatest thing right no different than when we created websites back in the 90s when there was only 25 websites on the planet uh, a little taxonomy called uh, Yahoo was all you really needed to do a, a category search to find the content you wanted. Now every page of every blog is a website. And that's the biggest thing you need to start thinking about. Every single article, post, page, I'm using WordPress as an example here, and if every single post and page is a website onto itself. It is a landing page onto itself. No one comes in via the main page anymore. So when you think about the sheer mass of content that is being created because of that change in mindset, the platform's the least of your worries. It's about the signal to noise and how to get your message seen to a wider audience because it's more than 25 sites now. Does that kind of make sense? Yep. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, you're oh, out. Geez, I'm yeah, spinning. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Scary. Uh, yeah, so, sum up. Um, please, user, websites, social media accounts. Yeah, uh, like I said earlier, uh, if you're interested in what I was talking with with uh, socialbusinessmentor.com, uh, I do have a social novel on that site. It's a mix of about uh, 44, 49 podcasts as well as a whole bunch of articles. I, I call it the Social Business Mentor Compendium. It is running on Blogger. Uh, feel free to have a peek. I'm also available on iTunes, so if you do a search on the Social Business Hangout podcast series, there's about 97 podcasts there. That's currently 
currently on hiatus. If you go to uh, Poptix TV, that's what I'm working on right now, which is all the uh, live-to-air and live-to-tape uh, video stuff that we're doing. Uh, we just created a little uh, a public service announcement on how to skydive naked. Uh, so if you go to howtoskydivenaked.com, uh, that, that's literally brand new, and that's a WordPress uh, site. But at the end of the day, if all you're doing is trying to find me online, I can be found found at R L A V I G N E four two. That's the number forty two because there's forty two in everything I do. So that's rlevine forty two dot com. That'll redirect you to my about dot me, which will connect you everywhere. And what I do for a living, among many other things, is if you go to the socialbusinessmentor.com, uh, if you like what you see, there's a, a page at the top there that allows you to uh, book sessions with me. And what I do is I do this worldwide over Skype and Google Hangout, and I do one-hour sessions to uh, help businesses uh, change themselves in this modern world. That's it in a nutshell. And I think um, you know, booking a session with you will be worthwhile, everything I know about you. And Knowing what you've learned in the last seven or eight years, you know it, it's funny. To, it's funny to think that all of this started with life at forty-two. Yes. Yes. Long story behind that, which you can find out at you know, our life at life at forty-two dot com, which is a life at Yes. Anyway, Rob, I want to thank you for um, yeah, my pleasure. With us today, and also, you know, being up at three in the morning, I owe you a case thirty-four. <laughs> And I owe you a case of Red Bull. <laughs> you, owe, you owe me a case of Red Bull. And, and then some. Um, next time I'm in Canada, we'll meet. Do the usual. Very much so. But you, again, you, thanks again. Thank you. It's been thank way you. too long, sir. Take care, everybody. Okay, take care, Rob. Bye. Bye.